And now on to our speaker for the evening, Adam Ferguson. Adam was born and grew up in regional New South Wales, Australia, before receiving his Bachelor of Photography from Queensland College of Art, Griffith University in 2004. After graduating, he traveled from port to port through the Caribbean and Mediterranean as crew on a sailboat to fund, to fund the launch of his photographic career. Adam first gained recognition for, for his work in 2009 when he embarked on a sustained survey of the US-led war in Afghanistan. Since that time, he's worked internationally with a focus on conflict, contributing to the New York Times, Time Magazine, and National Geographic, among others. Over the years, he's been the recipient of multiple awards from Photo District News, American Photography, World Press Photo, and Pictures of the Year International. His work has been exhibited internationally in both solo and group exhibitions. He currently lives in Brooklyn, New York, and is working on two monographs, a war diary of his time in Afghanistan, and a, a critique of contemporary regional Australian identity. As anyone who knows me, I'm a voracious consumer of news and take the New York Times at home. I love a paper paper. On the morning of July 1st, I opened the paper, which is here, and I saw this photo. And I was immediately captivated by a photo essay on the front page about migrants at the Mexican border. The photo essay contained, continued inside the paper, and I was struck by the beauty of the images, the vulnerability of the subjects, and the ambiguity of the remote controls that figured so prominently. Were they detonating a bomb, or were they releasing the shutter of a camera? Only after reading the captions did I understand that the sitters were co-authors in the construction of the images. I loved them and I thought, how crazy would it be for us to have these images in the window gallery? So I found Adam's website and emailed him to see if an exhibition was planned. Adam responded immediately and while no such exhibition was planned, we began a discussion of how we might work together and a short two months later, voila, here we are. Sometimes things just work out. So after that long-winded introduction, let's give a warm Hendrix welcome to Adam. Thank you, so uh, thank you very much, Mary, uh, for believing in this work and for having me out here. And thank you to Victor and Sarah and Amanda and all the, your guys' team that kind of put this together and, and honoured the work that I made with these migrants on the border. Um, and thank you everybody for coming tonight to, uh, to listen. I appreciate it. Is that, can you hear when it's clipped like that? Can we, uh, can we take those down? Hmm. Technology, not my finest. Uh, I'll let you sort this out. That's great. Thank you, Victor. Uh, I, I'll start with, with um, my time in Afghanistan, where I made this picture, um, because I think that's really where I found my footing as a storyteller. Um, and I think the reason I ended up in Afghanistan as a place to find my footing is because, you know, I had, I had grown up in regional Australia and, and felt kind of like a lot of teenage men and women, a kind of strong kind of discontent with my position in the world. And, you know, I, I had everything going for me. I had education and I had housing and I had health care and... There was no reason for that, but it was a bit entitled. But I, I hit my teen years and went from a, a relatively good student uh, and a school captain to a total high school dropout. And I think that's because I really struggled to kind of, to reconcile the ethics that I was kind of forming as a young man with the ones that I saw kind of dominating the world and, and struggling to, to look out into the world and see kind of like poverty and conflict and, and try and understand those things, and I really couldn't. Um, 
So after school, I found myself at art college on a, on a total whim. Um, I had no idea that I wanted to embark on a career as a photojournalist or a documentary photographer or a storyteller or an artist, whatever kind of label um, the work deserves. But, I, uh, but when I got to art college in my early 20s and I started to see the work of, of documentary photographers and storytellers and look at conflict photography and in-depth kind of photo reports that told the story of people marginalized, that work spoke to me deeply and I, from that day on I had no doubt that that would not be my trajectory as a, as a photographer. Um, so in 2008, uh, after a few years of trying to find my feet and running out of money and kind of struggling like most kind of young creative people do, I, uh, I bought uh, a ticket to, to Kabul. Um, and I really had no idea what I'd find when I landed in that conflict. Um, I wasn't sure whether there'd be rockets flying through the sky or, or bombs going off or, you know, gun battles in the street. I was totally naive. Um, but I knew that that was a war that I wanted to kind of participate in the conversation around. I was at art college when 9-11 happened. The year I graduated, I protested against the war in Iraq with fellow art students at my college. Um, and I very much knew that I wanted to go out into the world and, and, and participate in this critical dialogue around conflict and social issues. And, and all of a sudden, you know, I knew that the camera was kind of my way to kind of reconcile all those things that had made me a high school dropout. Um, So I landed in Kabul and I started wandering the streets and photographing daily life. And I found people living their life amidst this incredibly fraught geopolitical situation. Uh, this was an image I made in 2009 during a, a period of presidential elections. I think one of the other reasons that I really I felt compelled to participate in dialogue around conflict was that every kind of nation on the planet has been kind of formed out of some form of conflict. And, you know, I looked at the photos of my grandfather in, who served in World War II, and there was this kind of rite of passage for men in particular um, to kind of go to war and be on the front line. And that was something that I felt like I needed to do. These, after my first trip to Kabul, I started to receive assignments for the New York Times, and that kind of became my vehicle to keep exploring this conflict. This was an image I made in 2009. I was sitting at the New York Times Bureau this morning, and this suicide bomb went off about five blocks away from the house. My window shuttered, and I kind of grabbed my cameras and ran out the door and was at the scene a few minutes later. These kind of scenes were incredibly hard to photograph. Um, because the Afghan security forces would arrive within 10 or 15 minutes and lock the scene down and then you were kind of locked out as a journalist. <laughs> the next kind of phase in this body of work is when I started to embed with US forces. Um, and over between 2009 and, and 2012, I did about 15 embeds with US Army and US Marines in various parts of the country. And the thing that I really tried to do here was kind of unpack what it meant for these kind of young men out there on the front line, so to speak. Uh, young men that felt disillusioned with the reasons that they were in Afghanistan. Um, soldiers and marines that you know joined the military in this kind of spirit of post 9-11 nationalism and then had a lot of trouble kind of piecing that ideology together once they were kind of in these remote corners of the war in afghanistan fighting 
factions of the Taliban or even just local farmers or insurgent groups that weren't even Taliban. One of the things that I attempted to do in this work is, is move away from, I guess, the Hollywood spectacle of what it meant to be uh, a soldier or a Marine. And I guess in an image like this, perhaps I didn't achieve that. But as I moved kind of through this work and continued to work in Afghanistan, I started to find the pictures in the downtime much more interesting than the sensational moments of conflict. And I think these images became more interesting to me because they started to get at the psychology of what it meant to be a soldier or a Marine, uh, experiencing that kind of isolation, shitting in a plastic bag, living in a remote combat operations post for months at a time, uh, and feeling kind of utter disillus disillusionment. And boredom really became one of the themes that underpinned the work that I did there more than the kinetic gunfights. I've always found uh, in my own work images like this much more interesting than images of somebody shooting a gun or some heightened kind of moment of war. It's so surreal to look at these photos now given what's happened in Afghanistan over the last few weeks and watching this kind of rapid withdrawal and see the country just back under Taliban control. I have incredibly mixed feelings about it. Part of it feels inevitable in a way, um, but it also raises a lot of questions for a lot of the people I spent time with serving there, a lot of colleagues that spent time there, a lot of people that kind of risked their lives for, for a mission that just kind of just fell over so quickly. It's, it's so hard to kind of fathom. So, this image is, represents the first portraiture that I, I started. And all the early work that I did, working as a, a, a war photographer, for lack, as, lack of a better term, was, you know, reportage work that I made on assignment as a photojournalist for newspapers and magazines, primarily Time Magazine and the New York Times. And in my spare time, when I was on these uh, military embeds, I had a medium format 6x6 camera. And in the downtime, I just started making some portraits. And the work was never published with any of the stories that I, I had published from this time. But whenever I saw an opportunity, um, I, would, I would make one of these, make one of these medium format portraits. This was in Helmand province in southern Afghanistan in 2010. The resolution on that one is not good. Uh, this was in the Karangal Valley in 2009. And I, I didn't really totally grasp what I was doing at the time. It was just a, like an intuitive response as a photographer. But I liked playing with the backgrounds and the juxtaposing of elements between characters and signifiers in the scene and to create these environmental portraits, which in many ways, now I look back at them, speak more about the war than than the photojournalism that I made. So there's a transition here, I guess, that I'm trying to make is that from that early work as a photojournalist, I really, and, and I didn't totally comprehend it, Mary, until you pointed it out today, but there was a point in my career I became a, a portrait photographer more than a photojournalist. And I think that's solidified with these photographs here when in, uh, 2015, I went out to the USS Roosevelt. Um, it was in the, in the Arabian Gulf at the time, or the Persian Gulf, and it was conducting all the, the bombing missions against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And the New York Times sent me out there with a, with a writer of theirs, with their Pentagon correspondent, Helene Cooper, and the, the brief was to, to make a, a, a report on the bombing missions. And I, find myself, I found myself standing on the flight deck of this aircraft carrier photographing the, 
the pilots hopping in and out of jets and these jets kind of taking off this runway. And the whole thing was like super exciting and spectacular. And, and uh, I felt utterly disappointed with the work because I, after my first night shooting, I looked at the photographs and I realized that there was no image I could make out on that flight deck that didn't look like a Top Gun photo that didn't absolutely kind of uh, speak of this kind of spectacle of war and, and represent a very Hollywood narrative. And I felt inadequate as a storyteller to be able to unpack uh, the story that was in my mind, which was the future of warfare, which is that there will probably never be another large scale ground intervention like there was in Iraq or Afghanistan for that matter and that wars are increasingly fought technologically uh, with aerial bombardments by fighter pilots like this and with drone warfare. And, I, and I, couldn't, I couldn't capture that as a storyteller on this flight deck and making this kind of reportage. So I decided to make a series of portraits of these faces of modern warfare. Um, so I commandeered the public affairs studio on the, on the ship and they had one small LED light. And I photographed these guys. I photographed four guys on the first day, and then the public affairs people told me that that was all I could have. And then I refused to leave and said I wouldn't get off the boat until they found me five more people. <laughs> and, and I made these portraits. On, on the second day, I couldn't have access to the public affairs studio, so I set up a kitchen table out of the mess hall in a hallway, which was a dark enough brown kind of wood veneer to appear like it was a black background. And I photographed the rest of the pilots uh, in a hallway with a kitchen table. Um, so it was a very kind of impromptu um, studio situation. Um, Sorry, I can't see my notes now that that light's so dark. <laughs> I think one of the things that, as I was making this work, became important to me was I wanted to I wanted I wanted to negate this kind of spectacle of war that I that I discussed. And you know, these these guys are responsible for, you know carrying out some very valid, important missions. But then sometimes the intelligence is wrong, and they also drop bombs on civilians. So it's a very, it's a very complicated um, dynamic. And I know a lot of the work that these guys do rests heavy on them. So it's not, a, uh, it's not as simple as, as it being a, uh, you know, a hero's mission out there. And I wanted to present these guys in a very kind of fraught, poignant way. As a kind of sneaky portrait photographer, one of, the, uh, one of the ways I did this was I sat these guys in, in the studio space and in the hallway, and I kind of refused to talk to them. And I would wait until they got so bored that they had a moment to themselves, and then that tended to be the photograph that, that made the final edit of pictures. Um, at one point, the, the, the Pentagon correspondent that I was working with pulled me aside and, and got upset with me because she felt that I was being so rude to all the pilots. Um, but it was kind of my tactic to get this kind of fraught gaze kind of looking off the camera. Um, I mean, I would never, I would never do that to um, a, a person in a situation that I didn't think could, could handle that kind of treatment. Um, but I felt like these guys were tough enough and it was acceptable. Um, as an extension of that portrait work, I then uh, went on assignment to northern Nigeria for the New York Times um, in 2017. And I went with a, with, a, with a writer, and we were there to work on a story that we never got access to. But while we were there, we, we found a couple of young women that had been kidnapped by Boko Haram and trained as 
suicide bombers and sent out on a, on a bombing mission to blow themselves up in a crowded market or in a, at a military checkpoint. And, you know, it just it seemed like such an extraordinary story. Um, and the writer I was with had reported on this in some other parts of West Africa. But we started to wonder how many, uh, how many of these young women were out there. Um, so we engaged a, a very sweet Ni Nigerian journalist who actually sadly passed recently. He was a total crusader for human rights. His name was Shehu Abubakar. And, um, and he researched for a few weeks and he found a, a vast number of these young women that had, had been through the same uh, experience. Uh, many of them had had their, f their families killed, siblings killed. Uh, this young woman in particular's name is Aisha, and she was kidnapped from her parents uh, with her little brother. Her little brother actually uh, was trained as a suicide bomber and was sent out, and he did detonate himself. Uh, so then when it came time for Aisha to, to go out on her mission, um, if I recall correctly, she was kind of given the, the ultimatum that she would sleep with the, the Boko Haram soldiers or she would go on a suicide bombing mission, and she chose the latter. But instead of kind of carrying out this act of war, uh, she kind of had the courage and the resilience to find help and get this kind of suicide vest off her. I mean, you can only imagine how terrifying that experience is. So when I was going back to, to make this series of work, I wanted to make a set of portraits which felt beautiful and celebrated these characters um, in a way. And I looked at a lot of work from northern Nigeria um, and, and Africa in general, and I didn't want to make another set of pictures which made these young women look kind of marginalized and poor and like victims. Um, I felt like there was enough, enough of that. Um, so I started looking at a lot of fashion photography uh, that women's faces were concealed. Um, I looked at a bunch of painting and found one particular Belgian painter, in particular Mikhail Boromans, that had made all these incredibly powerful, eerily silent portraits um, of young girls uh, from behind. And that body of work of his became a very kind of clear reference point for, for me in this work. Um, it felt very difficult going into it to kind of create a poignant set of pictures when you can't show someone's face and show the, the facial expressions and the details. Um, so I needed to make kind of very simple but very kind of, uh, kind of structured and striking portraits. So when I got there, my job in a way kind of became a a set designer in a way that it had never happened before. Um, I had a very short amount of time with each, with each girl. Um, we had to keep their identities concealed because there were still Boko Haram operatives working in the community. A lot of them hadn't disclosed to their extended family or the people that they were staying with if their family had been killed. Their history because of the stigma associated with it. Um, so they would come into town uh, to meet me and a, 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 our fixer and, and the, the writer, and we would do an interview and a photograph. And sometimes I had like five or ten minutes with each one of these guys. So it became, became this kind of artistic process of going, OK, how can we, where do I photograph this person in the next ten minutes? And kind of choosing a color that I felt like complemented each girl's outfit, their obeyers. Um, and, and, and just making that happen really quick. But I started to intervene on this, so it was kind of like another extension of uh, the evolution of my own portraiture, where I intervened in a way that I kind of hadn't necessarily done before when the, all the other documentary portrait I'd made had been more conventional. But in this one, for example, I'd seen a, it was actually a, a photo that was commissioned by Prada with this kind of hood that went out like this. Um, so to conceal Aisha's eyes, I asked her to pull her hood down and pull it out. And I kind of deliberately kind of referenced this kind of high fashion image that I'd seen. And in a way, it felt a little, I, I was trying to kind of subvert the image of a marginalized Nigeria woman by kind of putting these little hat tilts to kind of beauty and culture into the images.
this was one of the last pictures I made on that trip and uh, this young woman turned up to the hotel that me and the writer were staying in and they had an abandoned conference room that hadn't been used for years and it was full of chairs and dust and all the rest of it. Um, it was an absolute mess. So we went in there and there was all these old flowers, plastic flowers kind of laying around. So I asked her to hold a bunch of flowers in front of her face to conceal her identity. Then in, uh, I, I had worked uh, historically in Iraq um, between 2010 and, and 2014 and, and when ISIS swept into uh, northern Iraq in 2014 from Syria and formed the, the caliphate, uh, I was there and I covered the exodus of the Yazidi which were an ethnic group that lived on the primarily on the border of Iraq and Syria. And what happened when ISIS kind of came through there is they captured all the women, or any women they could, um, the young children, they executed a lot of the men. And the Yazidi group in particular were, were, were persecuted more than, more than most in Iraq. Um, and then in 2000, August 2014, as I was photographing tens of thousands of Yazidi people come from Syria after they'd fled Iraq back into a safer part of northern Iraq. Um, I flew on a, an Iraqi military uh, rescue mission to pick up about 50 Yazidis that were stuck in the mountains that didn't have the kind of physical capacity to, to walk out. And uh, we, after picking up the Yazidis, we, we actually crashed. Um, and the pilot died and uh, about five of the people that were displaced died and there was a whole lot of injuries. Um, so I had, a, I had a connection to this story and a connection to the Yazidi people um, kind of through this traumatic experience. Um, so in 2019, the New York Times Magazine asked me to return to Iraq and do a story about trauma and, and how that had impacted uh, primarily the children, um, Yazidi children. Um, and what was happening then is in, in 2019 is like the last kind of ISIS strongholds in Syria were being attacked. There was tens of thousands of Yazidis being released um, gradually over months as ISIS kind of totally got hunted out of those like last bastions of Syria. The, there was these waves of Yazidi children who had been in captivity for four years um, released. So I, I visited a bunch of these children living uh, in, the, in IDP camps uh, that were scattered throughout to Hook province in northern Iraq. This, um, I think this, this photograph is, um, is an important photograph for my practice because, you know, I'm, I'm ultimately here because of the, these collaborative portraits that I made with migrants. But this, this series of pictures that I made with these Yazidi children uh, were probably the, the most collaborative portraits I'd made before this current, the, the series of the migrants. And I think this was a, a, a further extension of like me kind of intervening as a photographer to, to, make, uh, to make images. So what happened um, for this particular picture is I was drinking tea with this young boy's name's Rezin and his uncle who was his caretaker, the rest of his family had been killed. Uh, we sat down and we, 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 I interviewed them and heard, heard the story for about 45 minutes. And during that, during that time of sitting with this family in their tent, in this IDP camp, uh, Rezin came in just like he is now and he laid on his uncle's lap and his uncle put his hand on his, on his face in this kind of embracing touch. And I noticed it, but we're in the middle of an interview. I had a notepad in my hand. I wasn't ready to photograph it. Um, so when we finished the interview and it came time to make an image, I simply asked his uncle and, and Rezin if they would just do that again for me. And I set up a flash and I, and I made that portrait. So it's, it's staged, but 
the moment is kind of anchored in the integrity of what I saw them do themselves. And this whole series of portraits kind of became like that. I, through talking to people and listening and just being in that space and hearing their stories, those stories would inform poses. This young girl on the left, uh, Christina, she was, uh, she was, she's 12 years old at the time of the photograph, and she was, uh, man, the resolution on these is really bad. I'm just, uh, Victor, sorry guys, is there a focus on this? Maybe we could, a focus on the projector? Are they really that? Are they, they look terrible, right? No, they're not They should be, uh, I mean, they're, they're definitely high enough resolution, so it looks like the projector's out of focus. Okay, anyway, try and imagine that they're sharp. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, this, uh, this young girl, Christina, she spent four years, a third of her life, in ISIS captivity. And, like, you know, you would presume that she'd had this horrific experience, you know, with these terrible people that we've kind of read about, you know. Um, but her experience was actually the opposite. She, she was kidnapped from her family. She was sold in a human market to a family that treated her like their own daughter and looked after her and taught her to speak uh, Arabic. And when, that, when, she was, uh, when she was freed in 2019, she got back to her biological parents who were poor. They lived in a refugee camp. Um, and they spoke her second language in a language that she barely remembered from when she was eight years old, four years earlier. So it was this very interesting dynamic of this, uh, you know, you would think this young girl is thrilled to, you know, be released from her captors and get back to her real mum and dad. And, she, she didn't really want to be there. She wanted to go back to her ISIS family. Um, there's al always these such extraordinary kind of contradictions in this kind of work. I also made this set of pictures in 2019, um, and this, these set of pictures of, are of protesters in, in Hong Kong, student protesters that were fighting for democracy. Um, I found myself there on assignment for Time Magazine working as a, as a photojournalist. Um, I was on the streets making a, a visual report of the protests and the tear gassing and the kind of spectacle of protest. Um, and that, 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 you know, ran as a magazine story. But when I was there, I just kept, again, feeling a natural inclination to want to make portraits. So I, I pitched this story to my editor at Time magazine under the premise that we would make a set of portraits about surveillance. Um, and there was a lot of photographers that were, were photographing, uh, you know, these protesters and these kind of like, gladiators on the street and all their gas masks and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I felt like there was kind of something missing in the coverage. And I wanted to make something that really, that really hinted at the kind of larger themes behind this story. And that's kind of state surveillance and how technology is in many ways kind of changing protest. Um, and to me, these protesters kind of symbolize the future of protest. People operating in complete anonymity, hiding from the law, hiding from cameras hiding from surveillance. So I, uh, I rented a studio, a, c a commercial photography studio in, in Hong Kong, and I hired a commercial assistant in Hong Kong, a local guy who was used to you know, lighting Audis for car campaigns. And we ran this shoot like a, a commercial shoot. Um, 
I had a couple of local journalists and a lot, the protesters took a lot of persuading to come to the studio because they felt like it was some kind of Chinese trap. Um, but we persevered and I think we ended up with about 35 protesters in the end that, that came through the studio. And I asked them all to just bring their protest gear, whatever they had. And some turned up with gas masks and others turned up with not much at all. Um, and as I started to photograph them, I realized that um, it was hard to connect to the kind of, the, the kind of human nature um, and their, their kind of personality in a way, because everything was kind of obscured by the paraphernalia, the protest paraphernalia that they, they were kind of hiding under. So I asked very delicately um, that each protester trust me um, and I promised that I would somehow conceal their identity. So instead of photographing them in all their gear, I asked them to strip back to none of their gear. And then slowly together we kind of built up um, enough uh, of a mask to, to, to hide their identity. So this particular protester who um, went by the name of uh, Maggie, which isn't her real name, they all just used kind of made up names to hide their identity. This was her kind of scarf that she would pull over her face. So I just asked her to pull it up over her whole face. So it became this experiment with kind of props, if you like. Um, this, this photograph is, is, is similar. He, uh, it was the thing that he would put over his mask for the tear gas, so he just uh, put it over his eyes. This was a young couple that met on the streets protesting and formed a relationship. With, uh, with this young man, he had a, uh, a full paper uh, mask of a, a pro-Beijing opera singer. So I asked him to rip the mask in half so it just concealed half of his face and he closed his eyes. These were two 16-year-old uh, students. Um, and they actually came in and I photographed them both in all their, in, you know, with, uh, I think I got one to hold a gas mask in front of his face. Um, I can't remember exactly what the other one did, but I photographed them with their, you know, some form of protest gear, concealing their identity. And then I moved on to the next protester and I kind of turned around at one point as I'm photographing um, the next subject and I saw these two guys in like, you know, with backpacks, one of them in their kind of white, you know, pressed school shirt walking out the door and I was kind of like, hang on, they're the guys that I just photographed? I hadn't seen them come in, so I, I begged them to come back and instead of photographing them with their, their protest gear, I just asked them could I photograph them as, as students. And obviously I just photographed this guy from behind and I said to this guy, what's in your backpack? And he said, my school books. And I said, perfect, so let's hold a school book in front of your face. Um, so it became a very kind of, you know, organic process of playing with props and constructing these kind of portraits in a studio. And I felt like I had to make, I had to make one photograph uh, with somebody holding a phone because it, 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 part of me was worried that it would feel like an obvious picture, but the way these kids use cell phones on the streets was just extraordinary. It was absolute democratic, uh, a democratic process in the sense that they would all vote on the, the app Telegram and that would kind of guide where they would move on the streets, how they would interact. Um, when the police would converge on one place, they'd all vote on their phones as to where the next place would be in real time and they'd all disappear under the, the subway and then there'd be a, another flashpoint and they'll deciding this in real time on their cell phones. It was extraordinary to watch. And their, their motto for this was, be water. So this is a, a, an ongoing series of photographs I'm making in my homeland of Australia. Um, and I think that I, I, I thought I would include these because this is an important set of pictures for me because in many ways as a photographer, this work has helped me kind of I rehabilitate myself from all this kind of time working internationally and, and not working in my own uh, context. Um, and 
in around 2013, I started to feel very kind of burnt out, covering kind of conflict, and I knew that I, I needed to have a, I needed to be exploring my own story in a way, just to kind of, just so I didn't lose my kind of footing as a human. I needed to go back to my own space and, and be in touch with a, with a country that I knew and understood and, and, and embark on kind of a photographic journey with that. And it was, it was, as I said, it was like a self-prescribed kind of therapy in a way. And this work for me is really a, a look at the colonial legacy of Australia. I grew up in a, in a well, not grew up, but the first years of my life were in a small town in, in regional Australia, a farming town where my mother was from, um, by the name of Yeovil. And I have all these kind of strong childhood memories of kind of being there, you know, like characters, uncles, the light, the smells. And that's kind of, a, you know, a very integral uh, part of my, my memory and my experience. So, you know, after I kind of, when I got to high school, I moved to the coast and kind of left this kind of part of the country behind. But I've started to explore that again, kind of in my adult life. Um, and I'm looking for, in doing it, I'm, I'm not necessarily working as a kind of photojournalist with a, with a, with a news narrative. But it's more an open-ended kind of exploration where I'm looking at things that I remember. I'm trying to kind of find characters that reference characters that I have in my mind from being a kid. Um, I'm looking for those kind of same scenes and those same smells that I know. I'm also trying to photograph Australia, an Australia that is kind of vanishing and is like, like many parts of the world, uh, you know, regional culture continually kind of gets evaporated by globalization, the forces of kind of mechanization and centralization, depopulation. Uh, but there's still these kind of pockets of the interior of Australia, in the outback, for lack of a better term, uh, where this Australia from my youth exists. It's a look at dying traditions. And I'm looking for, when I'm, when I'm making this work, I'm really just looking for single pictures from scenes that somehow kind of become metaphors for the larger themes. This photograph here on the right is a, uh, or on your left, I should say, is from what's called a bachelor and spinster ball. And back in the day, the country gentry in Australia would have these black and white tie bowls where all the, the affluent farmers would send their kids from these remote cattle stations to a bowl to meet a suitable partner, potentially a wife. And over the years, these have turned into these drunken, debaucherous affairs where hundreds of kids listen to rock music and get absolutely wasted and spit dye all over each other. So it's, it's been a bit of a cultural fall from grace, but these young drunk kids rolling around in the grass in public felt like a, a, a symbol of that kind of cultural shift. One of the other things I'm looking for in this work is references to popular culture. And I think one of the, one of the other reasons I'm, I'm, att I'm attempting to kind of like explore this story is that I think the interior of Australia hasn't necessarily been represented um, in a very interesting way. You know, there's been a lot of, there has been some kind of good films and there's been kind of good literature written, but there's also been a majority of of, of stuff that I think isn't very intelligent or representative or insightful. You know, films like Crocodile Dundee, which I'm sure everybody here in America knows. Um, so on this work, I'm looking, for, I'm looking for, for characters that are somehow linked to popular culture and kind of attempting to unpack that popular culture. This is a drag queen in, in Broken Hill in the center of Australia. And she performs in a tribute show to Priscilla, uh, Queen of the Desert. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have seen that film. Um, so there's, there's a few scenes in that film that are filmed in this iconic pub in Broken Hill. And, and this drag queen 
Um, Brendan, his name is, he's a gay man that kind of lives in regional Australia. He, he performs in this place where they made part of the movie and he does the tribute show. Um, but instead of photographing Brendan doing the tribute show, I've decided to photograph him in his backyard. And in a way, I'm trying to take these, these figures from popular culture and, and kind of look behind the scenes as a way to kind of unpack our understanding of the outback. Mining has been a, a big part of the colonization of the interior of Australia. Uh, this is at a, a, a small opal mine in Andamooka in South Australia. It's the kind of place where people kind of run away to and, and hide in the bush. I made this picture during a seven year drought in Australia. So a big part of this landscape is becoming more and more affected by climate change. This was on a, this is the death pit on a, on a third generation farmer um, whose sheep would just continually die because he just couldn't keep the feed up to them. This is an indigenous elder from Warakurna in Western Australia. Uh, Daisy Ward is her name. She's the last generation of, a, of Aboriginals really to be born in the bush. She was not born in a hospital. Um, her parents are now passed, but you know, they, they had her out in this country where we are right now um, in this photograph. So again, I'm kind of I'm, I'm searching, for, searching for people and, and moments that I think won't exist in another five or 10 years. So, migrantes. In earlier this year, when the border, the U.S.-Mexican border, was had this influx of of migrants that was kind of pegged to the change of administration and the the hope there'd be easier access to America. Um, you know, I was watching all these images of desperate people crossing the Rio Grande in in life rafts and inflatable tubes. Um, and all the rest of it. And I knew based on the data it was just going to intensify like it has in the months since I made this set of photographs. Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to make a set of pictures which somehow I hoped, or my intention at least was to inspire empathy with them. And I feel, I feel like the other images, even though they are important in a kind of functionary news sense, um, and the dissemination of that kind of you know, mainstream photojournalism every day is important for our kind of awareness of what's going on. I wanted to make a set of pictures which somehow moved away from presenting these people as victims and give a bit more of an insight into who they are as people and hopefully inspire empathy in, in an audience. Um, so I decided instead of going to the border, I would cross into Mexico. And, and meet people staying in shelters and informal camps. Um, and I thought a lot about how I would do this technically um, and what, what visual language would, would kind of achieve the, the goal that I had in mind. And I remembered a set of pictures that were made by Adam Broomberg and Oliver Chinaran in the early 2000s where they were uh, the editors of Colors magazine at the time, which is an Italian magazine that was part of the Benetton Foundation. And they did a series of portraits in a psychiatric institution in Cuba um, where they gave the cable release to the subjects. And I never forget these set of pictures um, from when I was at art college because somehow they, you know, I'd seen a lot of pictures of kind of, you know, mental hospitals and psychiatric institutions made by documentary photographers. 
which despite the eloquence and the kind of poetic nature of the work, still presented um, these people as kind of crazy and marginalized and destitute in a way. Um, and when I saw the set of images by Brunberg and Shinaran in this, in this psychiatric hospital where they had given the subjects the cable release, all of a sudden I had a new insight into what it meant for those people. They were humorous, there was joy, uh, and there were fun, and there was laughter. Um, and there was a, through that kind of surrendering of control, I felt like they created a new narrative about that experience. Um, and I remembered that set of set of pictures when I, when, I went, when I was considering this trip and I decided this would be a very interesting thing to do. Um, the other reason I thought this would be an interesting thing to do is there's been a lot of conversation around representation um, throughout my career. Um, and especially in the last three years since the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, we're, we're where there's been a bit of a kind of social reckoning on, you know, who's allowed to to tell, who's allowed to tell whose story, and what's okay, and uh, you know that's a, that's a long conversation. But I found myself kind of reviewing my own practice in a lot of ways, and there's been big parts of my career where I, as a, you know, relatively kind of affluent, privileged, you know, white photographer, I've had the opportunity to go and represent people. Um, and I wanted to kind of flip the script on this one. And I felt like this would be a, an empowering thing to just hand over the, the shutter release to these migrants and, and see, see, how that, see how that worked. Let them have a kind of stake in their own representation. Um, naively, this idea of mine was a little, uh, well, it was just naive because you know, I had these kind of artistic aims. And when I got down there and started having conversations with, with the migrants, you know, they were in the middle of one of their most significant life traumas. And they really didn't care about what I was trying to do as a photographer. And why should they, you know? Um, so they were kind of like, sure, give me the shutter release. I'll take my photo. Like, what do you mean you want me to take my own photo? Um, so, so I did have these kind of like, I did plan on having like, more extensive conversations with all the migrants and, and letting them kind of choose a pose and, and, and maybe like decide on something which they felt like represented their story, whether that was a mother deciding she would like to pose with her kid or a pet that they collected on the way or maybe there was one object that was of significance to them. And I, I tried to have these conversations, but these guys just, they just scrambled across Mexico and they just didn't have the bandwidth for those conversations, um, which you know, was absolutely fair. So the idea became a little more simple than what I had, had initially planned. And we just, I just chose a spot where they all were. Um, so this was in, uh, in a shelter where, where this man is staying, Carlos, um, and his son Ed Edison, or Anderson, I think it is. Um, so I just set up the camera on a tripod and I gave them a cable release and I let them make their own pictures. I would stand back and re the camera after each frame. Um, but it became this kind of like happy accident really where, where they would kind of choose their own moment. Um, this young girl's name is Stephanie Solano and I was walking through an informal camp and I saw her sitting exactly where she is. Um, and she was sitting there so gracefully and I knew immediately, I was like, I need to take a portrait of that girl sitting right there. Um, but her mother wasn't there. So we ended up finding her mother and then an hour or so later, um, uh, I asked her to sit back in that same spot where I saw her originally and she, she made herself portrait. Um, I think this work is, has an honesty to it that most of my other work doesn't because there's less of me in it. Um, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not kind of manufacturing a pose too much. I'm not introducing light. Um, and I'm stepping away from the camera. And the gaze that I think the migrants gave back at the camera, um, there's kind of a, there's just a kind of raw honesty to it, I think, because 
they know that they're making their own photograph. And I think, I think that was the success, which is their success, of this set of pictures. One of the things that really struck me on, on this project was the, the kind of the, the risks and the adversity that these migrants had undertaken um, to try and have a better life. I mean, many of the families had split up. So um, Rose, in particular, this woman, had left one sibling, sorry, one, one child in, I think it's, I can't remember if it's Guatemala or Honduras, but she'd left a child behind because she couldn't bring two people. Um, other families had kind of split up. There was, a, you know, one partner was already in the States with a child, the other one was traveling separate. They did whatever they could kind of afford to do. And however much money they kind of had to pay the, the smugglers and the cartels, they would kind of like, they would use that money to send part of the family and then try and get to America to make money and then send money back and then the rest could come. It was, it was extraordinary and also heartbreaking. Mary was asking me how this picture kind of came about and there was an area in this form, informal camp where there was one tap where a couple of hundred migrants all washed every day so they had to line up to wash. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to make a portrait of somebody having their daily bath at this place. Um, so I asked this man if he'd let me photograph him and my, my idea was to photograph him covered in soap suds because they would get wet, lather themselves up, come back to the tap and then kind of rinse off. Um, but it got really, the sun came out, it got really hot and all these soap suds kind of just like dissolved and were kind of running down his face into his eyes and he was struggling to keep his eyes open and I was trying to make a picture of him with his eyes open and with the suds. Um, and it became this kind of chaotic kind of mess of like it not kind of working and then all of a sudden I, I just kind of realized that the picture was w with him with his eyes closed, with the soap running into his eyes. So I just said, stop trying to keep your eyes open, just, just close them and make the photo. This couple had the baby in the shelter. They were from a, another state in Mexico. Her ex-partner was a cartel member and they were in hiding from him. This is uh, Amy Rose, she's a trans woman. She, uh, she has made it to America now actually, she got help by a, a group of lawyers that specialize in helping gay and trans people um, in Texas. So she's now in the United States, in Austin, Texas. Um, weirdly, for you know, this kind of fabulous trans woman with all this kind of personality and you know, the way she dressed as a migrant, she was kind of beautiful. Um, she was incredibly nervous when it came time to make the picture. She's the one, one migrant I thought would not be nervous and you know, I put the shutter, gave her the shutter release and she kind of froze up and didn't really know what to do. So I cocked the camera and just told her to do whatever she wanted. And I took uh, my translator and the, the other people that were kind of running this kind of informal shelter. It was a shelter just for trans people. And we kind of took everyone away and we all turned our backs and this is the portrait she made of herself. This portrait was made mid-interview, actually. I was still sitting down uh, talking to this woman at a government gymnasium that had been turned into a, a shelter, um, a municipal shelter for migrants. And she was sitting outside a tent and we started doing the interview um, with her and I was kind of squatting down. She was sitting on the ground on a crate and she started crying as, as we, were, we were speaking. So. I 
I kind of put, put the, the, the camera was already on a tripod. I kind of just sat it in front of her and gave her the cable release in the middle of the interview. And I just told her that whenever she felt like she wanted to, she could take a photo. Um, and through that interview, I think she made four or five photographs. But this is one of those photographs where she's sitting down talking to us. She kind of stopped talking, gazed at the camera, and, and took this photograph of herself. This family had been uh, held captive for two weeks um, prior to, to this, this photograph being made. Um, they'd been chained up to, to trees out in the kind of forest of the desert kind of area um, in Reynosa, or near Reynosa, right near the, the border. Um, they basically had paid the, the cartels um, their transit fee, but then a different cartel tried to extort them for more money and just kept them hostage for two weeks until they kind of let them go. And they'd been dropped at the migrant shelter two hours before I made this photograph. Um, and actually, Mary asked me when we were talking, I think this morning or last night, how, uh, you know, why, why do people, how do you get people to pose for you like that in such a, you know, crazy, traumatic kind of time in their life? Um, after you know, so much has happened and they, they just arrived at the shelter. They were covered in scratches and mosquito bites. They'd all been beaten. Um, but they just, they wanted, to, they wanted to talk. They needed to tell somebody what had happened. Um, so in many ways, you know, my role here wasn't being a photographer. It was being just somebody to listen to them. This man's wife was missing at the time that I made this portrait. This was at an informal camp in Reynosa. Uh, his wife and other child were, were being held by cartels outside the city somewhere. And they were kind of trying to extort them for some, some more money. Um, that's the end of my presentation, guys. Thank you for listening. Um, I think, um, I think we have time for some questions if anybody would like to pose one. Sure. Um, well, I think I went to art school, but I, my major was kind of documentary photography. So I really came out of art school, you know, as a, you know, kind of hell-bent on kind of photojournalism. And, you know, that was, I, I kind of entered the world where my process wasn't that reflective. Um, and I think most of the, even though I studied in art college, most of the most of the assignments I did with a, with a documentary photography or photojournalism major um, didn't necessarily um, you know, unpack my, my process in a way that it would have if I had have done, done a, an, an art major in photography. Um, so I think I entered the world um, as a photographer looking to you know, record things around me. Um, but over time, um, I think I've just got less, uh, less reactive as a photographer and started to, instead of kind of just making all those decisions in real time as I tell stories, to go into, um, in, go into projects with a very clear kind of conceptual framework of the kind of methodology, the reasons for the way I'm executing, um, the technical side of... Uh, my work and making those decisions, you know, before I undertake that work. Um, does that answer your question? It does. Can I ask like a 
Yeah, sure. I think it's really interesting about this idea that you have to teach these stories. Right. Like, I've never, I've never experienced What is that like? How does that kind of affect how you think about it? Sorry, what was that last bit which is for my stories? Well, yeah, it was when you're, you know, the process of teaching a story and how you learn what it's like and how that process kind of affects the rules that you're doing. Yeah, 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 that's a good question. You mean pitching like to a magazine or a competition? Yeah, I just created a number of different Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, like, there's another one in the gallery. Right. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's kind of a, in a way, it's a bit of a trade off, I think, pitching to a, a news organization, or maybe this is just how I feel at this point, point in my career. Um, but you know, you you tend to have to you know as a as a journalist kind of fit a story or fit a set of pictures within to a, a, a narrative which is in line with a narrative that a publication or a news organisation wants to tell. And sometimes you know, I'm very happy to participate in that, and uh, I I can kind of with with a say project like uh, this one about the migrants, um, because it was a, a photo uh, driven project. Um, I, I feel like the, the, the narrative that the newspaper, the New York Times, ended up kind of, you know, telling and the way that the work was framed, I was kind of happy with. Um, and the, all the decisions I made as a kind of, as a photographer were kind of respected. But I think there's, there has been many other situations in my career where I pitch a story or I, I work on a story where I, I feel a little disappointed in the ultimate output of how that work exists. But... You know, in many ways, even though I work as a documentary photographer, and I shouldn't say this out loud, I mean, magazines and, uh, for me, have always been a vehicle just to kind of make the work. Like, I always kind of see the work as existing beyond their, their publication, um, beyond that byline, beyond that, that newspaper. Um, and I've tried to look at, you know, photography like that. Kind of my whole career, I never really, I never set out to be a journalist. I set out to kind of be a photographer. Um, the kind of photography that I was interested in was stuff that explored social issues. So then that kind of, kind of rendered me in this kind of photojournalism kind of basket. But I think, you know, all the work that I've tried to undertake is, um, I hope that at some point it kind of transcends those, those kind of news narratives as I kind of curate it later in my career and form books and exhibitions and try and give that work a life beyond beyond the news. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. You've got to ask a question. You're a photographer. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's a question. I, I know you said uh, you gave up a lot of the control uh, because the process and you know, your, as you're struggling with representation mm -hmm. uh, as you're embarking on the series. Uh, but I can still tell this is your photograph because I think the way uh, you challenge narratives, you know, you're talking about how to represent uh, the girls in Africa or protesters or even your homeland, um, about you trying to challenge narratives. And so even though you gave over the shutter and all that, I can still do that as well. So I was, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about uh, how you challenge these narratives or uh, even changing the process, I can still have a, yeah. a signature. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought a bit about this after um, I made these portraits because a few people made a similar comment to you. And, you know, I think, you know, surrendering control of the shutter may have been a little, um, I mean, in a way it was kind of tokenistic, but I think, you know, it was still important. And we also, um, we gave a, a joint byline to the subjects of the photograph. So it was this kind of like co-authorship. Um, and joint profits, too, um, for the sale of the works. Um, so there was that kind of investment. But I guess, you know, at the end of the day, I kind of controlled this photographic technology. Um, I chose the framing. Um, I chose the backgrounds. Um, and I, I composed the camera and left it on a tripod. So I think there's still that inherent... Um, authorship from me in there, even though I didn't make the photograph. Yeah, I, I didn't mean that as like a, a token or something. It was just uh, your ability to create art in these uh, red portage uh, scenarios and, and still 
I don't know, just really beautiful things out of war and poverty and different parts too. So it's just just an all of it really. I have less of a question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Sure. We'll come back. Up. Oh, what kind of impacts has your work made on you personally? Like this obviously has to have an impact on you. You can't just be the storyteller. It also affects your own personal story as well. So you yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I'm totally insane. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, we all have a capacity for trauma, ultimately, and none of us know, you know, how deep that bucket is. So when that bucket is full, you have what you call clinical post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I haven't filled that bucket yet, but that doesn't mean that the work doesn't um, deeply affect me and, you know, I think a lot about it. I kind of live, I live it in many ways and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of distracting in many ways to just live a, um, you know, maybe a switched off uh, kind of well-adjusted life. I mean, there's definitely been periods of my life where I have covered a lot of conflict, where I have, you know, extract myself from those kind of theaters of war and I've been a kind of train wreck of a person, you know, drinking too much, um, unable to have relationships, just like a total mess. Um, and I actually, I made the decision um, after working a lot in Afghanistan and my career was kind of taking off a lot and then the Arab Spring happened. And I was offered um, assignments three times to, to go to Libya and I said no to all of them because I kind of knew within myself, even though kind of the ambitious side of me wanted to go and cover the Arab Spring, um, I knew that if I had have done that, if I had have just kept backing up that work, I don't think I would have ended up in a, in a very happy place. So I have, I have kind of moderated the, the tempo of my career. Um, and I, I chew off as much as I can process, and then I have a break, and then I start work again. Yeah. But, um, you know, I have a lot of colleagues who have, you know, mental health issues and some serious kind of trauma from some of their experiences and yeah it's kind of no joke you can't really unsee the things you've seen yeah yeah I'm not sure how else to answer that no, thank you for your answer Yeah, I've definitely been in situations where uh, people object um, to me to me photographing. Um, most of the time, I you know obviously with all the portrait portraiture, it's a negotiated um, interaction. But definitely, as a as a photojournalist, kind of covering stuff in real time, like making a photograph on a street or something, people can can get very upset. And I've had I've had a few scary situations where you know, people have got very upset. Um, I think the most scariest was um, at a mosque in Pakistan once, and um, I had permission from the, uh, from the mullah to be there at the mosque photographing. But uh, I got to the mosque um, 15 minutes late, prayer had started a bit early, and even though I'd spoken to him on the phone and he granted permission, um, I couldn't find him. Um, he hadn't turned up, there was another mullah there, it was, all, it was all very confusing. So I started photographing anyway, because I knew that I, in my mind, I had permission. Um, and then within kind of 15 minutes, you know, a couple of people had objected, um, and all of a sudden, you know, people were kind of accusing me of being like a spy, and a, an American spy, like a CIA agent, and it was in Peshawar in, in Pakistan, which isn't the safest kind of place for a for a white boy, and, uh, and the crowd turned on me. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden I had like 50 people kind of like punching me and trying to grab my camera, and um, I was actually saved that day by a Pakistani journalist who uh, 
who came out of the crowd. And at, at, at first, I thought he was trying to attack me too. Um, but he was a local journalist in Peshawar. Um, and he came in and he grabbed my camera and he kind of pulled it in tight and kind of hugged me. And he was just like, we're going to get you out of here like now. And he kind of just like kind of ran me through the crowd. And he's like, run to your car, run, run, run. And he was kind of screaming at me to get out of there. Um, and I ran to my car and my driver was still there. And I, my fixer, my translator who was with me, had kind of abandoned me because it was looking like it was going to go so sideways. Um, anyway, I dived in the car and my kind of was like, drive, drive, drive. And my driver took off. And um, you know, these, this angry mob was throwing rocks at me. So. Um, so sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's, you know, photography is a very intrusive kind of medium in, in many ways, especially when you haven't negotiated access with people as an outsider. And I think that was a, that was a moment where I, you know, was perhaps a little bit self-entitled about what I could, could and couldn't do and or what I could do, I should say. And yeah, it almost ended really badly. Did you have a question also? Okay, great. Yeah. Well, this was the first uh, lecture I've ever done in a in a mask. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you.